thanks a lot to Mikhail and uh, to organizers for this very nice conference for giving me a chance to be here with you and uh, talk a little bit about uh, what I've been doing over the past uh, three or four years and um, uh, which has to do mostly with non-parametric methods. And so in particular, the talk of today is uh, based on a paper that uh, hopefully sooner or later we will manage to write with Michael, okay? And uh, before getting into this specific paper, maybe let me uh, uh, just tell you a little bit, uh, a couple of things. So basically, this paper is indeed part of um, uh, uh, a kind of uh, uh, larger research project uh, on the use of uh, classical and Bayesian uh, non-parametric methods. Uh, uh, a little bit, as Matteo was saying, with the idea of seeing whether uh, adopting an even more general approach to handle parameter time variation and nonlinearity pays off, in particular during uh, problematic times. And at the same time, uh, trying to uh, uh, you know, import uh, these methods uh, from the statistical literature, adapting that to the kind of data that we have to analyze, so persistent and heteroscedastic, and uh, again, as Matteo was saying, trying to design estimation algorithms that also permit to apply these non-parametric methods <coughs> when you have uh, very large uh, dimensional data sets. So uh, I remember my first contact with non-parametrics was uh, uh, at the PhD as a student, uh, now decades ago, as <laughs> implied by Michele, right? And, um, and so I was reading a paper by Wolfgang Arbel, which actually then became a book that you may remember on uh, non-parametric regressions. And I was very fascinated by the kind of, uh, of techniques except that then it was virtually impossible to put it in practice. So this was the early 90s, so the most you could hope to do was a, a single uh, regression with one or two regressors and no more than that. And instead, nowadays, uh, we, we are lucky to have so much more computer power that made uh, uh, these methods, uh, again, feasible also for very, very large data sets, multivariate systems, and so on. And so this is why uh, I try to, to get uh, uh, into it uh, a little bit more, okay? So I uh, mostly worked uh, uh, with uh, a couple of co-authors and group of people. So on the classical non-parametrics, mostly with George Capetanius. And um, this is mostly to uh, non-parametric model time variation. And uh, uh, the idea is uh, to work with kernel estimators that, again, have a long tradition, for example, the work by Peter Robinson and his co-authors. And in the standard uh, non-parametric setting uh, with time-varying parameters uh, and kernel estimators, the assumption is that you have a deterministic uh, evolution in, uh, in the parameters, which can be a little bit restrictive for the kind of economic or financial applications that we have in mind. But then, uh, maybe now, eight or nine years ago, uh, uh, Ludius Giraitis, Capetanius, and Yates uh, showed that, uh, that actually, under a little bit more stringent conditions, uh, you can apply these paramet non-parametric uh, kernel-based estimators uh, also when you have stochastic time variation. Okay, so you need uh, still some assumptions like uh, you know relatively smooth parameter evolution, the fact that the parameter evolution kinds of dies out asymptotically, and so on. But uh, but it can be done. Okay. And so uh, at that point, the first paper in this line of research, uh, which is actually joint work with George and Fabrizio Venditti, who at the time was uh, at the ECB, uh, was trying to uh, use these non-parametric techniques to introduce uh, uh, time variation non-parametrically into uh, VARs. And uh, uh, at that time, uh, uh, the kind of benchmark that you could use uh, was uh, uh, for the large dimensional case, for example, the forgetting factor approach of Gary Coop and, uh, and Dimitris Korobilis in a Bayesian contest. But we wanted to stick uh, to, to classical. And so we uncovered a, a very old literature dating back from the 60s and to tile 
uh, on uh, what, uh, what are called stochastic constraints. And basically, these stochastic constraints uh, are a pretty neat way of uh, 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 introducing uh, regularization into classical estimators. So basically, you can get things like lasso or ridge or elastic net by working with these stochastic constraints. And so in this paper, basically, we were using these stochastic constraints to handle the, the large VAR part and uh, the kernel estimator to handle time variation. And so we were showing that uh, uh, you could indeed estimate even a VAR with 100 variables allowing for time variation, and the method was working reasonably well in uh, uh, both simulation and in practical applications. And again, linked to what uh, uh, Matteo was saying, we also showed that you could also do you know, kind of structural VAR analysis, so transmission, shock transmission, with time variation non-parametrically, non okay? And then again, with the idea that uh, uh, maybe time variation is also uh, important for more structural analysis, we try to implement uh, similar machinery to the case of instrumental variable estimation. And there, you know, you have a first stage that is typically your structural relationship uh, where uh, uh, um, there is an endogenous variable. And then you have uh, the, the second equation that links your endogenous variable with the instruments. And so the idea is that uh, maybe the relationship between the instrument uh, and uh, the endogenous variable can be time-bearing, but possibly the, the structural relationship itself could be also time-bearing. And again, we, we kind of uh, uh, extended uh, these uh, uh, non-parametric methods also to handle this type of situation. And for example, then you can use it to estimate uh, new Keynesian Phillips curves or equations where you have uh, uh, unobservable variables that can be estimated with errors and so treated as endogenous uh, and, uh, and so on, okay? And then, uh, again, we went farther and we thought that uh, maybe you can also put uh, at work these non-parametric estimators into uh, panel models with uh, stochastic time-varying coefficients that are a little bit an extension of uh, the random effects that you would use only for the intercept. And, uh, and so this is work with Dubai, who is a former student, is now at Monash. And uh, uh, then, uh, paper number four in this trend of literature with the idea that you want to handle these large data sets, uh, you could do time varying factor models non-parametrically, actually there is some work in that, or maybe even better, you can work with targeted factors. So this three-pass regression filter, I guess most of you are familiar with it, was uh, introduced by Kelly and Prout uh, in a journal econometrics paper 2015. And uh, uh, it is the idea that uh, you want to summarize the information into a large set of X variables keeping in mind that you want then to use these factors to predict a variable of interest, okay? And uh, so this is basically a generalization of partial least squares, and so uh, it is called three-pass regression filter because uh, uh, it's very nice. You can get the whole thing done uh, by a set of OLS regressions. And so the idea is that you could have time variation in all of these three steps, and again, it's a little bit more messy than the standard factor analysis, but uh, hopefully now we cracked it, and so Yanis is presenting this paper at the EIAA meetings um, in Oslo in a couple of weeks, okay? And then finally, something uh, uh, on which uh, we have worked a little bit uh, uh, um, uh, also recently, so with uh, uh, Robin Brown and, and again George, and so this is even more structural. So here the idea is uh, uh, to put uh, these non-parametric estimators at work in the context of, uh, of proxies var. And again, proxies var have become uh, a very common and convenient tool uh, uh, for uh, structural analysis. And uh, uh, again, uh, there are ways to introduce uh, parametric time variation. So Paul has a nice paper in, in Restat uh, uh, on a Bayesian method for doing that. Here we wanted to do it again using these uh, uh, kernel type estimators. Uh, and uh, again, you need to twist a little bit the theory, but then it works uh, pretty nicely. And in that paper, we've applied it uh, uh, specifically to understanding the effects of uh, non-standard monetary policy and quantitative easing on, uh, uh, on financial variables. And so it focuses on the UK, but we also got some results for the Euro area. Okay.
Okay. And so this is, uh, again, all, all classical, and it focuses on, uh, 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 again, more general ways to handle time variation, both for forecasting and for structural analysis. Um, then, uh, uh, instead, uh, there is uh, some work that I have been doing, again, over the past three, four years uh, on uh, Bayesian non-parametrics. And again, this is a kind of funny story because as an undergraduate, uh, I was trained by Bayesian statisticians because uh, 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 basically at Bocconi, uh, they hired uh, as professors in the 70s and 80s, uh, those that were the best uh, pupils of De Finetti. And so there is a very strong Bayesian tradition, uh, uh, except that, you know, it took four courses uh, to uh, discuss Bayesian linear regression model because I, I learned everything about exchangeability, all beautiful theory. But, and so in the end, uh, again, uh, I kind of abandoned it. And then instead, uh, uh, it kind of, you know, old memories reemerge. And uh, uh, so first uh, with uh, a series of papers, uh, mostly with Todd Clark and Andrea Carriero on, on parametric Bayesian. And then uh, uh, by chance at the conference, uh, uh, I was lucky enough enough to meet uh, Florian Huber, and I was introduced to his research group. And so we started uh, uh, working on uh, uh, this kind of Bayesian parametrics. Uh, and again, this is mostly importing techniques uh, developed in the statistical literature and adapting uh, them uh, for uh, use with the economic and financial data, okay? And so the first paper uh, uh, in this trend of research, again, is work with, uh, with Florian and uh, Michael and also Todd and Gary Coop. Uh, and this has to do with tail forecasting with uh, multivariate Bayesian additive regression trees that are a tool that we will also use in today's paper, which is basically a Bayesian version of uh, uh, boosted trees or, or random forests, uh, as you will see. And uh, it tends to work particularly well and particularly well in the tails. So for doing uh, GDP at risk, inflation at risk, uh, so it would fit very nicely the, the title of the conference, okay? And so one problem with this tail analysis that maybe will we'll come back uh, uh, also in other papers today is that, uh, uh, you know, this kind of methods like quantile regressions were indeed uh, designed for uh, statistical data sets or micro data sets in economics. And so often in the tails you have very few observations. And when you apply them with quarterly but even monthly data, uh, uh, often, uh, 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 you know, it's not so clear that you can use them. And uh, uh, there is a nice paper that you may have seen by Victor Chernuzokov and co-authors in Ristad, where they propose a kind of rule of thumb to decide whether you can still use quantile methods or you should use extreme value theory. And uh, for most of the empirical macro applications, that rule of thumb tells you that indeed you should move to extreme value theory. And uh, a possible way out of that uh, is indeed either to go Bayesian and so to try to use shrinkage uh, to reduce the dimensionality of the parameters, uh, or maybe, uh, like in the second paper, to take a panel approach. And so to hope that, uh, say, the tail behavior in many countries is comparable, and so you can get additional information on the tails uh, by pooling uh, uh, different, uh, different data sets. And so in that second paper, basically, we built uh, a, a, a multivariate uh, quantile model that has the feature of uh, combining a linear and a nonlinear quantile regression, where the nonlinear part is again modeled with, uh, with the BART specification. And it's nice because it shows that when you are near the center of the distribution, the weight on the nonlinear part is very close to zero, while when you move close to the tails, instead uh, uh, the nonlinear quantile regression becomes uh, the dominant part, okay? And then paper number three, uh, again, since of course there is also a lot of interest in, in inflation in general, and given that we are in a central bank, applies this kind of technique specifically to forecasting inflation, so in this case, uh, uh, US inflation. And instead, paper number four, it's also something that we will look at a little bit closer today. It works with a different kind of Bayesian non-parametric technique, which is called the Gaussian process. And again, we will come back to this today, but as you will see, it's just uh, 
another way of approximating unknown uh, nonlinear functions. So with BART, uh, basically, uh, you use a basis of uh, step functions. And uh, uh, with the Gaussian process, you use a basis uh, uh, of uh, uh, Gaussian functions with different means and different variances, OK? So um, then there are a few other papers that are uh, maybe more uh, uh, applied using these techniques. Uh, uh, one uh, has to do, for example, with how do you construct linear projections with this kind of uh, more flexible techniques. Uh, the second one applies it to climate, again, in particular, looking at the effects of uh, tail climate events on tail economic events. And uh, the third one, oil in the tails, is something that we are working with, with Christiane Baumeister. And again, given all the problematic events that we have seen in the recent past uh, uh, in the oil market, but in the gas market and so on, we thought that uh, it could be interesting. And then instead, the third method, uh, uh, Bayesian non-parametric, if you wish, that, uh, that uh, I've been doing some work on has to do with uh, Bayesian neural networks. But on this, uh, uh, Karin knows much more than me, and she will tell you a little bit later today. Okay. And so uh, uh, let me now move uh, uh, instead uh, more uh, properly to the paper of today. So the paper of today is basically a kind of overview and uh, the idea was uh, uh, to look at uh, specification and estimation of some of these uh, Bayesian non-parametric models, specifically uh, uh, thinking of using them for forecasting, possibly large sets of uh, macroeconomic and financial variables, and focusing on BART and, uh, and Gaussian processes, and comparing them with various types of Bayesian VARs. Okay? And again, uh, with big thanks to Marta Bambura, the application is on the euro area and on this uh, uh, very nice real-time data set that Marta and co-authors have put together and, uh, and were very nice to, to share with us. Okay? So let me tell you a little bit about uh, the uh, econometric framework. So the idea, you have a general model that is like equation one. And uh, so here you have a set of explanatory variables that can be legs of y's, but they could also be exogenous regressors that are grouped into x. Your target variable is y, and the relationship between y and x is unknown. So it is this f function, which is actually a vector of little f functions, that are unknowns. And then there is uh, an additive error structure. And so uh, we need to say something about how to approximate uh, capital F and the little f that compose it, uh, and something about uh, the, the error structure. Okay. So uh, uh, the simplest possibility is to assume that F is linear. So this would give you a, a VAR. And so indeed, our benchmark in this forecast exercise will be a Bayesian uh, linear VAR with, uh, uh, um, uh, as you will see, global local shrinkage priors that already it's a pretty tough benchmark. Uh, but uh, uh, also to make it maybe a little bit fairer as comparison with these more flexible models, we also consider uh, a version of this VAR with time variation in the coefficients, a little bit like in the original work by Giorgio Primiceri, where all the coefficients in the dynamics can evolve according according to random walks. So this makes it uh, pretty flexible, but at the same time, the parameterization remains uh, uh, relatively small. Then uh, the first non-parametric uh, Bayesian techniques we consider is BART. So basically, as I was telling you, the idea of BART is uh, to approximate uh, uh, this unknown f function with uh, an average of trees. So for us, we will use about 250 trees. You can also, of course, change the number of it. And uh, I mean, uh, 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 if you look at some of the previous paper, or if you look at the Chipman et al. paper, there is, of course, a much deeper discussion on, on how you would do this. But basically, the starting point is the tree. So the tree, you need to decide uh, if it is a shallow tree, so if it's relatively small, or, or if it is a tall tree, and you have to decide how many branching you have, and you know you need to decide uh, what is the number of the final values uh, and things like this. So this is uh, 
uh, all handle, as, as you may see in the paper, again, hopefully very soon, uh, all the details on this. But just to give you a simple example, imagine that you have uh, a single dependent variable y and a single predictor x. So basically, uh, uh, in this case, uh, uh, your tree uh, uh, would be uh, uh, basically just branching. Maybe if we look at the picture, it will be even clearer. Okay, so you have to decide first whether your x variable is below or above a certain threshold value. This gives you the first branching. Then in the second branching, again, you have a decision rule if you are to the left or to the right. Okay, and so basically you need to decide, uh, uh, you need to treat a stochastic both the number of branches that you have and the threshold values in there. And so there are proper priors to, to do this. And on the right hand side, you see how this tree would work with simulated data. So in this case, simulated data are generated with trigonometric functions. And uh, so the true expected value is uh, the one that you see there that looks like uh, a sine or a cosine, so like a wave. And uh, the tree is approximated it, uh, with, these, uh, with this step function. And so you see that basically one possibility to improve to get a better approximation is to work with, uh, with taller trees. Or the other possibility instead is to average a lot of shallow trees. And so here, again, in the left, you see the same picture that we saw before. And instead, to the right, you see what happens if you average 250 of these relatively shallow trees. And so you see that basically already 250 does a pretty good job at approximating the uh, the nonlinear expected value there. And of course, the larger it says or the taller the trees, uh, the better the approximation becomes, okay? So there is always a trade-off, of course, uh, uh, because, you know, the more trees and the more complicated the tree structure, the more computational expensive the method becomes, okay? But this gives you an idea. So again, this is the idea that you approximate this unknown f function with an average of step functions, okay? Um, how about Gaussian process? So Gaussian process, uh, there is this very nice book by Williams and Rasmussen that describes it uh, uh, both nicely technically, but it also gives you an intuition of how the thing is working. Uh, uh, so there are various ways to think about it. As I was telling you, the first possibility is to think about approximating this little f function with an infinite average of Gaussian distribution with different means and variances, okay? So this mimics the idea of having uh, another orthonormal basis to approximate. But the way that instead is typically introduced in statistical text is by thinking that this f function is unknown, there is an infinite number of them, and you want to put a prior on this infinite dimensional object. And so the Gaussian process prior is a way to do this. And then once you condition on the axis, on the data that you have, basically this gives you a, a, a finite, in this case, multivariate Gaussian distribution on F1, F2, Ft. Okay, and so you basically do it like this. And so this multivariate Gaussian distribution will be typically centered on zero, but you can also center it on something else like deterministic components. And it will be characterized by uh, what we would call a covariance matrix. And in this literature it's called a, a kernel uh, a kernel function. Uh, uh, and so uh, again, depending on the type of kernel function that you use, uh, you will approximate arbitrarily well any types of f functions. So this is a very general tool. For example, there are choices of this kernel function kappa that uh, makes the Gaussian process very similar to Bayesian neural networks, okay? So the standard choice uh, is to work instead uh, with uh, uh, a Gaussian kernel, like the one that you see in the last line. And this has the advantage that it only depends uh, on uh, these two parameters. So you see the psi there and the, and the L. And so you see basically uh, uh, this D measures the distance. So it is X T minus X tau. And so you see that if the distance is equal to zero, uh, basically, kappa becomes the variance, and so that psi parameter is a parameter that controls the variability, 
okay? And instead, the L parameter is what controls the smoothness of the function. So you see that uh, the larger is L, the, the more differences between Xt and Xtau change the shape of the F function, okay? And so the next slide gives you the same picture we saw before. So this is the same uh, generated data from the cosine function. So H is what I was calling Li before. So you see that if you put uh, Li that here I'm calling H very close to zero, basically you go back to the linear world. And so you see that the posterior distribution that you see down there in the left side of this slide is very close to uh, a linear regression function where if you choose a large value for h, then you get uh, much more variability in the shape of the f function. And so in this case, you see that the posterior tracks uh, extremely well the nonlinear expected value that you get in there, okay? And so these two parameters, uh, L and uh, Xi are uh, basically treated as random, so you will put priors only on them, also on them, and uh, uh, you have to design a proper MCMC algorithm, okay? Um, how about the conditional variances? So, uh, uh, because you know, here there is a trade-off, because the, the more flexibility you put in the conditional mean, the less relevant typically becomes to allow for heteroscedasticity. And indeed, this is an empirical result that, that we will also reproduce. Uh, while if you work with the linear VAR, Bayesian VAR, it is particularly important to allow for stochastic volatility. And so in this case, we work with what is called a factor stochastic volatility structure. So this is introduced uh, in, in the statistical literature by Aguiar and West and also Silvia Fushishnatter worked on it uh, and so on. And from an economic point of view, there are some, uh, there is an older paper by Lucrezia Reichlin and co-author noticing that indeed uh, the, the volatility of macro variables is pretty common. And then we did some work on that also uh, with Andrea Carriero and Todd Clark. Like we have a JBS paper showing that indeed there is quite a lot of, of commonality. And so in that case, basically, you assume that the errors have a factor structure. So these F are common factors that uh, themselves have stochastic volatility. L is a matrix of loadings. And then each error also has uh, an idiosyncratic uh, component, uh, eta, that also is characterized by stochastic volatility. And you see that the etas are idiosyncratic. So this H matrix is diagonal. So basically here, all the commonality in the epsilon is captured by L times F. And so this is beautiful because once you condition then on this L times F, uh, uh, you can do equation by equation estimation, okay? And so this is also something that Josh and Gary and other co-authors use uh, to simplify uh, structural inference, I mean structural analysis with VARs because it would give you independence to rotation of the variables, okay? Um, so we, we work with this, so we work with this type of stochastic volatility. Uh, in the paper, uh, well, in earlier results that I didn't put in there, we also tried uh, stochastic volatility with T-distributed shocks, but in the end the results were pretty similar to those that I will show you, and so uh, I have not included them in here. But so the idea is to look at homoscedastic stochastic volatility with this factor structure and possibly the T-distributed shock, but again, in the end, they didn't help uh, so much, okay? And so you see the models we have are basically linear, possibly with the uh, time variation in the parameters, but Gaussian process, and then homoscedastic or uh, heteroscedastic, okay? So this uh, uh, is another example with simulated data to show you how it works. So on the uh, top left panel, you see data generated by a linear regression model. And so in this case, of course, the linear regression, the linear model is, uh, is the best one. Uh, but you see that Bart and Gaussian process are also doing a decent job. Of course, they are a little bit more volatile, okay? And again, the volatility would decrease uh, if you increase S in the case of BART uh, or if you work with a smaller value for H in the case of the Gaussian process, okay? But then you see that as long as you introduce uh, 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 
non-linearity. So in the top right panel, you get a kind of parabolic behavior. The, uh, the bottom left uh, is the wave uh, thing that we have seen so far. And the bottom right uh, is a kinked uh, regression function, like, uh, you know, at a certain point, quantitative easing uh, kicks in and, and you get this kind of behavior. And so you see how, of course, in this situation, the linear regression model would give you a very poor fit and very poor forecast as well, uh, while this uh, both BART and the Gaussian process uh, can do a pretty good job uh, in approximating generic types of nonlinearities. Okay, so here, both BART and GP have no idea what is the true F function. It's exactly the same model applied to any data generating process, and you see that they do a pretty good job whatever the type of F function that is generating the data. Um, in terms of the estimation algorithm, I have very little time left, so maybe we can go pretty fast. But just to tell you that it is not difficult, uh, there is also a lot of code that we have put on GitHub uh, in case you want to play around with this, and then we will also distribute the code for this very specific paper here. Uh, uh, the only thing uh, uh, that maybe I can mention, so I can skip then the later slides, uh, uh, the only complication is in the case of the Gaussian process uh, because uh, those two parameters, so the Xi and the L or H, basically uh, you need metropolis asking steps for them, uh, uh, and so that slows down a little bit the computations, uh, but only a little bit, as you will see uh, in a little bit. Okay, so let me skip these that were just giving you a few more details, but again, we can skip, so we can use the final seven or eight minutes uh, for the empirical application, okay? Okay, so empirical application, as I was telling you, uh, uh, is done uh, for the Euro area with this nice data that uh, Marta Bambura and co-authors put together and kindly gave to us. And so here, uh, basically, the beauty of it is that it's a pretty long data set uh, quarterly starting in 1980. And so we can have about 20 years for doing a forecast evaluation, which is pretty uncommon for the Euro area. And again, in addition, uh, you, you can do this in real time because they collected all the vintages for this data. So there are about 15, 20 variables in, in the data set. So the results that I will show you today are for a small model that includes only GDP growth, uh, inflation, and the change in unemployment. And hopefully in the next version, we will work with a 15 variable model similar to the one that typically are used, uh, are used for the US, okay? Um, then again, in the paper we will describe, there are also uh, some things that of course you have to do to handle the ragged edges, so how to handle missing observations with these nonlinear models, but nothing particularly interesting from a theoretical point of view. So these are the data, the, the vintages, and uh, uh, um, so you see that there are some uh, uh, little changes in it. Maybe the latest example is, uh, uh, you may have seen this latest revision of uh, uh, the real GDP growth data that Eurostat did for the last two quarters, where now technically we have entered a recession in the Euro area, while in the first release the data were either zero or slightly positive. Um, so the, the idea is, okay, let's see whether this thing matters, okay? Um, so how about the evaluation? So again, here uh, we construct point forecasts, interval, and densities, uh, uh, and we are particularly interested in the at-risk part, just to be in line with the conference. So uh, we will look at uh, the standard uh, uh, Q continuously rank uh, probability score, but also weighted version where you give more weight to the left tail or to the right tail. And then we will also consider more specifically the quantile scores, and in particular the quantile score uh, at the 50th percentile is very close to the mean absolute error, and so it can provide a way to also get an idea of the quality of the, of the point forecast uh, in this case, okay? So this gives you an idea of the estimation times, as, as I told you before. So in this case, basically, the linear VAR takes about 30 seconds for 10,000 posterior and predictive draws. Uh, and this is on uh, uh, basically Micro's laptop, so it's nothing uh, fancy. Then, of course, we run it on the cluster, so of course it's much, much faster, but just to give you an idea of the way of the time here. And so you see that adding stochastic volatility 
changes very little things. And you see that BART, both homoscedastic and stochastic volatility, is pretty comparable with, uh, with the standard linear VAR. And uh, uh, the Gaussian processes, as I was telling you, are just maybe twice say, uh, as expensive in terms of time. And again, this is due to these metropolis assisting steps that you need to include in the Gibbs sampler. But still, it's something that you can do very fast, even on a normal laptop. Okay. So how about the results? So this table we discussed a lot with Michael because I said it's too crammed, but he said, no, you have to show it. So <laughs> I'm showing it, okay. So let me tell you very briefly what's in here. So these are results for H equal one and the next results, the next table will be for four quarter ahead and eight quarters ahead. So here you get four vertical blocks uh, where it says none is uh, the standard CRPS. So it's the density. Then you get uh, the CRPS overweighted on the left tail, overweighted on the right tail, and the QS50 that is similar to the mean absolute error. Okay. Then uh, in each vertical panel, you have uh, four columns, and this is the full period, so the evaluation done over the 20 years from 20, so from 2000 until 2021. And then you have pre-COVID, so until the end of 2019, post-COVID with the warning that it is only seven or eight quarters. And then you have recession and expansion as dated by the Euro Area Business Cycle Committee. Okay. And then you have uh, the three horizontal big panels uh, that are uh, GDP growth, inflation, and the change in the unemployment rate. And then you have the various models. So the linear BVAR is a benchmark. So value smaller than one means that you do better than the, than the uh, linear BVAR. And so you see you have uh, the, the time varying BVAR, you have the BART, uh, you have the Gaussian process, and so on. So uh, uh, again, it's pretty crammed, but uh, there are a couple of things that you can look at. First, the colors. So when it looks bluish, it's smaller than one. And you see that there is quite a lot of bluish in here. And the bold numbers uh, are uh, uh, the, the best performing models. Okay. So if you look at GDP growth, uh, 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 the kind of result uh, that emerges is that over the full sample, you do better uh, uh, than the standard BVAR. And uh, you do particularly better during COVID uh, and in part during recessions. Uh, uh, but the interesting thing is that one model that does pretty well, it's already the standard BVAR with stochastic volatility. And so this relates to a paper that we did with Andrea and Todd uh, uh, and also to the work that Dario will present later on, showing that basically if you are interested in growth at risk, like uh, the Adrian Boyarchenko and Giannone paper, basically a BVAR with stochastic volatility is already doing the job for you because it allows for changes in the mean and changes in the variance. And during recession, the variance increases. And so this gives you the kind of asymmetric behavior in the 5th and 95th percentile that you would also get with the quantile regression. Okay. So for inflation, instead, uh, uh, the Gaussian process is particularly good, both in general and uh, during uh, uh, um, uh, recession times or, or expansion times. While for the change in unemployment rate, you also see that there are some gains. Uh, and also for this, the Gaussian process is doing uh, uh, a relatively good job. Okay. So then again, there are results for H equal four, for H equal eight, let me skip them. And then we also did an analysis that is similar to the uh, Giacomini-Rossi fluctuation test. So here we have computed uh, the same loss functions, uh, but taking uh, averages only over eight quarters, uh, enrolling uh, the evaluation period over time. So just to give you an idea of uh, uh, when they work particularly well. And so the different colors of the lines are for the different models. And here, the only thing I would like you to notice uh, uh, is that you see the final part of each graph to the right is the COVID period. So it's after 2019 Q4. And you see that there, basically, when you focus specifically on the COVID period, all of these uh, Bart and Gaussian processes are doing much better than, uh, than the standard linear VAR, also once you add stochastic volatility in there. 
Okay, so let me just uh, wrap up. Again, this paper is basically a review on uh, specification of estimation of Bayesian non-parametric modeling for forecasting, and in particular for tail forecasting. And again, since the method uh, can be estimated equation by equation, you can also handle like 20, 25, but also 100 variables, and uh, the computation costs are, are relatively small Okay, for, for doing this. Uh, and then again, uh, as you have seen, the, the forecasting performance is pretty good. Uh, um, and overall, uh, uh, in particular, uh, basically the, the, the kind of, uh, uh, um, you see, Gaussian process VAR seems to do particularly well during problematic periods. And so if you want to have a relatively robust method for doing the at-risk forecast, this could be a, a decent choice. So thank you so much, and I will stop here. So thank you, Massimiliano. Let's uh, then open uh, the question. Uh, Pablo Guerron from uh, Boston College. I have a very interesting presentation. So one question that I'm wondering about uh, the method is about stability. So you didn't discuss anything about stationarity. And you know, once we move from linear models, this becomes a, a dicey aspect. And if you look at the unemployment regressions, as you go to H equals eight, I believe you see the your process deteriorates a lot in the quality. So I, I want to collect your thoughts about this. And the other one, uh, what language do you use uh, to program? Oh, th thank you so much. So this is indeed quite important. So uh, the language is R, and indeed we have lots of packages put together for this. And stability, indeed, it's an important thing. So. For example, what I didn't discuss is that in here, uh, uh, we use the proper iterated approach for constructing the forecast from the nonlinear model. So everything is simulated forward. Uh, 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 and so we do F of F of F of F. And so that is indeed pretty tricky without, without stability. Um, so stability in this nonlinear world, it's pretty difficult to analyze. One possibility is, uh, say, you can work uh, uh, this we have it done in this paper coming out in the I, uh, IR. So you can uh, you can work with the, the best linear approximation in the kullback cool library sense to this model, and then study whether, say, this linear approximation is stable or not. And the other possibility, you can just uh, uh, iterate forward uh, the model, like we do when we construct the forecast for, say, maybe 50, 60 periods, uh, and see that the thing does not explode. But uh, at the moment, we, we do not uh, impose anything uh, that, impose it, that would impose stability. And again, part of the thing is that uh, this thing is kind of so flexible that, you know, in, in a sense, it's less of an issue than, uh, than in the standard linear VAR. But indeed, it's something that would deserve uh, a, a deeper investigation. Thanks, Pablo. Hi, um, so it's a, a partly question, partly a suggestion. So uh, my experience when using linear VARs, uh, especially uh, including COVID data, is that it's important to have the stochastic volatility. And on top of that, it's important to have the sort of like scaling uh, the extreme observations as you as, as you do in the restart paper you mentioned. So in that respect, you know, <laughs> it would be interesting uh, for me to see how these methods that you propose um, like fair in compared to such a linear VAR where you like, you know, where you really deal with this, you know, extreme observations uh, in the errors, like, you know, the best as you can, but keeping linearity in the coefficients, uh, you know, compared to uh, when you um, release or, or like, you know, wh when you go to a non-parametric non-linear method. No, thanks, Marta. Indeed, this is a very good suggestion. So the idea of, of doing the t-distributed shock was <laughs> to go a bit in that direction without all the complications of the restart paper. So what we tried is that, like a t-student with three degrees of freedom, and uh, again, for, for, for Bart and Gaussian process, that didn't change much, but for the linear BVAR, it, it changed a bit. So maybe we, we can add uh, that at least for the linear BVAR and, uh, and do the comparison with that. So that's a very good point. Thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, fascinating stuff, Massimiliano. I'm always intrigued by this trade-off between uh, uh, fit and forecast. So you skipped, uh, you, you were very quick on the uh, H greater than one. Um, uh, can you say something? Because I, I, I see many red things there. I assume that the, 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 you know, the longer is the, the forecast horizon, maybe the worse is also because maybe, you know, the precision is not huge. I mean, what's, what's your view there? No, th that's another very good point. So the thing that here deteriorates much uh, is unemployment, um, while instead uh, for inflation you keep getting uh, big gains, like uh, 10 to 20 percent also for H equal 8, and for GDP growth basically it be the ratios become close to 1. So it seems to be more variable specific uh, than, than anything. And it relates a little bit to what Pablo was saying. So I guess as long as it doesn't explode, it, uh, it kind of helps you also at longer horizons. Hi, Massimiliano. Uh, in the other paper that you got with Florian, uh, you were using subspace shrinkage. Uh, you were also using Dirichlet process mixture on the variants. Are you planning to put it inside this? And secondly, when you were doing the real data in the BART, how many trees are you drawing? Again, 250, because I guess you're adding a lot of noise maybe, because also when you were doing the simulation, it seems that when you have constant behavior, you have a lot of noise, I guess, and maybe the huge amount of trees can increase a lot the number of noise. I don't know, that, that, that's a point, because we saw with Florian also in other works, that, that's a point. No, thanks a lot, Luca. So basically, Luca with Florian is another of the fathers of Bart <laughs> in macros, so but this is very welcome. Now, the the thing on uh, the first question. So the so basically, what Luca was mentioning, I I didn't discuss it. You can also work with these nonlinear processes for modeling the variances. And so rather than having, say, stochastic volatility for the variance, you could have Gaussian processes or the Dirichlet mixture processes that Luca was saying. So in, in this paper, that is another paper with, uh, with Andrea, Gary, and Florian, we do not find uh, big gains, at least for the macro data from the, the Dirichlet mixture process at, at the point that the referee said, take it out, so <laughs> we took it out, and so here we, we, we didn't try that. And instead, the subspace uh, shrinkage prior is something that uh, can be used to further improve the computational efficiency when you're working with a very large model. And so since here we are working only with three variables, it wasn't so, so useful, but for larger models, indeed, it can help. And the idea on the fewer trees, indeed, that is a very good point. So maybe we can try and see what happens if we go down to 50, whatever. So in one of the papers, we also made S a hyperparameter and tried to get it by the marginal likelihood. But yeah, here we can just see what happens. Thanks. Thank you. This was very interesting. And I I was intrigued and by the BART, some of the BART work. And I'm, I wanted to know if you thought about kind of storytelling or structural interpretation of results. And when you were presenting, what came to mind is that when you presented a, a tree with many branches, there's, it seemed kind of e easier to think about some structure and some uh, uh, macro dynamics playing out. I, I didn't see that immediately when you have a, a big forest maybe of little bushes or not. So what I was wondering is uh, whether that's also a way of thinking about trade-offs of uh, ap applied work, for instance, in central banks. Or... Thanks, Dario. So this is another very interesting point that would open up <laughs> so on how to do a structural interpretation of this model. So there are two ways that we have explored in some of those other papers. One is, again, to look at uh, the closest linear approximation. And then in there, you can do the standard analysis. The other one is to keep the structure and focus on specific parts of the distribution. Like in one of the papers, for example, we show that the tail behavior in the BART is mostly driven by financial variables. So in this sense, uh, it's true, say, what you would get from the quantile regression can be mimicked uh, also, also in here. And, and the third way of doing it is with these Shapley values that would tell you what are the most relevant variables driving the, the, the nonlinearities. But that, that's another very good point. 